Hey there, Diane. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. We are pumped to talk to you. And, uh, you know, you're pretty close. You're in our neck of the woods being up in, you know, the Toronto area and us being down here close to Windsor, Ontario. So, you know, it's nice to talk to a fellow Ontarian, but uh, Diane, uh, fill us in on the details, you know, tell us, uh, we know you're from Toronto, but tell us, you know, what, what grade level you're teaching and uh, just a little bit about, uh, you know, what, what, what life is like at your school. Sure. Well, um, I'm in the TDSB at an elementary school that's actually quite unique from others. We are an alt one of the alternative schools, Alpha Alternative. So it's a democratic alternative school. It's very small, 80 kids altogether from K to six. And I teach the grades three, four, five, and six math and also French. Awesome. And um, so we have a big social emotional uh, component to our, our school environment. It's a great community school. And uh, I've been teaching there for about six years, teaching math um, as like really just um, had those six years to focus on teaching math. Before that, I, I wasn't so much focused on math pedagogy. Um, what else do you want to know? Uh, I'm sure I'm sure a lot <laughs> we'll, will we'll dig we'll the dig conversation. Yeah. yeah so no okay. panic no panic but I'm uh I'm actually very intrigued you're in like you said a, a unique school a unique setup and you're teaching across uh you know a span of grade levels um so I'm sure more information will come out about that um and also something that is interesting to me you had said before we hit record that You've been listening since pretty much the beginning of the podcast. And John, if we do the math and we work our way Ooh. back, that's probably shortly after you started at this school focusing in on math. So mm. I'm kind of curious just off the bat, like, were you, were you searching on the internet to try to figure out like, okay, I haven't really been focusing on math. Like what should I do or how can I do this? Maybe more, you know, more effectively. Um, what was your thinking and is the timing about right when you say you started listening and you started this role with a uh, heavier focus on the mathematics? Yeah, that's, that's right. I think I just did an online search um, for math educator podcasts and I listened to a few and I was really psyched to find one that was uh, an Ontario based podcast Little did I know then that you would like sweep the globe as <laughs> just like you've done. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it influenced me quite a bit. Like I discovered Peter Liliadal through your podcast, a lot mm -hmm. of like Kathy Fosnott, Joe Bowler. I think I, I found a lot of those um, big names through, through oh, uh, being a listener, right? Awesome. Great yeah. to great to hear about that. That's partly, you know, our mission is to is to share different, you know, nuggets of of insight, different ideas for for folks to get started in their classroom and then, you know, go deeper when they need to go deeper deeper. Um Diane, and oh, incidentally, go ahead. okay, I was an early joiner when you first started the academy. Oh. When you had that offer. Yeah, like yeah. join Very our cool. brand new academy. Wow, that's um, old school. Yeah. 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 John, wow. John, go down memory lane for a second. I'm curious <laughs> if you know where you were where we were when we hit launch on the academy. I remember at the time mm -hmm. we were so mm -hmm. nervous because we're like, I don't know if it's yeah. gonna break. I know exactly like, where is, we were. Is it I know where we were too? Yeah. Where were we? We we were in Delta BC. We were, exactly. we were Delta BC at a kind of an, an, assessment, an assessment conference, but we were spending the wow. afternoon at an Airbnb. We were on the deck and we were just crunching through getting this website ready to go. And we hit send and the folks like you joined over, you know, that evening and yeah. overnight and we woke up and there was a, a bunch of people, you know, signed up for the yeah. Academy. So, Very so cool. exciting, exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, Diane, tell us your math moment, because I know that's not your math moment, but tell us your math moment no. about, you know, flashing back, you know, what, when we say math class, yeah. what is, what is, has stuck with you all these years? Uh -huh. um, so I have a memory of being probably in grade three or four, maybe, maybe three, um, or maybe a little younger, actually. I, I just remember stacking digits and doing the adding and that I had developed a system where for every digit I had mapped onto that digit dots of the same number hmm. so that I could count on, hmm. like say it was eight 
plus four, four had four little spots for me. And mm. I would start at the eight and then I would count up onto the digit four. And um, looking back at that, I just realized that I was one of those kids who needed the concrete representation for longer. I was moved on to digits too soon, which I think is true for a lot of kids, the abstract digits before I had the schema, you know, in my mind. Um, and, and then having a sense of sort of catch up uh, really ever since in a way, like I was a good math student, but I didn't own math. Uh, mm. And I was much more on the arts and, uh, you know, literacy side. So mm. it's been a big surprise to me that I ended up focusing as a math teacher rather than, you know, arts and literacy, which seems like a more natural fit for me. Um, but yeah, just that, um, that moment of working really hard to add single digits that were stacked and not having any sense of place value, just like mm -hmm. doing the algorithm the way I had been shown and, uh, and working out my own little secret way to sort of cheat by counting onto the numbers. Mm. It, oh, it's, I love how you just said it. You felt, you know, as a student, I think there's a lot of times where we pick up on a pattern or a behavior or a strategy and somehow in our minds, like we were convinced that that's cheating, you know, like counting with your fingers is cheating for a lot of kids. Uh -huh. It's like parents say not to do that. And mm -hmm. in reality, it's actually, that's reinforcement. You, you mentioned something that jumped out at me was this idea of not owning the math. And I think for so many people, even those who might've been considered good at math, never really owned it. I never really owned it. I never had strategies like you had done. I just sort of, I guess, was lucky and, and you know, just the, uh, we'll call it automatic. I don't want to say automaticity because I didn't have like a fluency with it, but it was just sort of, I just did it. I didn't have to think about it. Mm -hmm but I also didn't understand it, which meant if anything was out of whack, like if anything kind of like broke the pattern, I was sort of lost, you know, like, Oh, I've never seen that before. So I'm done. Right. And I, I often yeah. equate it to this idea of following a GPS. If you always follow a GPS in the same neighborhoods and then the GPS shuts off, you're stuck, you know, you, you have no other sort of schema to try to work through it. And, you know, it, it's really interesting when you hear different educators with different experiences, it seems like whether they were told through their grades that they owned the math or whether they knew they didn't own the math, it feels like everyone feels like they didn't have a good grasp of it at the time. Um, so I'm wondering, how would you say that Im impacts or influences your approach to teaching and, you know, I guess, do, does it cause you to do anything differently for the students that you're working with when you think about how you learned and how I'm sure many of the other students in front of you might be either similar or very different to the experience you had? Sure, yeah. Um, I think it causes me to really emphasize the conceptual side and try to keep things concrete and visual as much as possible. Um, I'm always mm -hmm. asking the kids, does that make sense? You know, does that make sense to you? And um, uh, yeah, just wanting to have those conversations and and see those light bulbs go off um, mm. rather than like, I'm really kind of allergic to even teaching the algorithms, but I do, but I do after mm -hmm. teaching a whole lot of other strategies. Right, right. And it's funny because the, the kids are often like, I like stacking the best, you know, like stacking works. And, and I'm like, yeah, it does, but it, it doesn't always make sense. Like just the other day we had, you know, 8.91 minus 0.99 and they were stacking it and borrowing. Mm. And I was like, come on, remember that over and back strategy we talked about? Like yeah. it was a money context. Like why not just take off a dollar? You right. know, a couple of kids came up with it. This was in the consolidation. Um, but most of them were still like their go-to is stacking. Yeah. Even though like I've been de-emphasizing it. So anyway, 
quick no. thinking brain oh, loves yeah. to take charge, right? Exactly. The slow and methodical but, thinker over here is harder yeah. to get going and it's harder to motivate. It's like over here, it's like, nope, I know what to do. Doop, doop, doop. And That's I right. don't have to even think about it, even though it's a lot more work to get there. It's like, it requires less thinking, which I think That's can right. really be a struggle to try to encourage you know, a little bit more intentional thinking there. Yeah, which is like a stepping back first before you dive into the algorithm. It's totally. like, what are these numbers and what's the best strategy with these numbers? Yeah. And, and think about think about the win you get when, because like, you know, you, you, can te- you can teach the algorithm, like you said, you teach it at the end and they want to rely on that. But when you start to see and you're looking for kids to be that, you know, to take that, that flexibility in that 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 strategy to go, you know what? The more efficient strategy is that one. And when you see that jump, that's when you're like, they got this. You know, when you can you can uh-huh. look for the jumps from from moving from one strategy to the other and being that you know watching for that selection because that when you watch for the selection or see that selection, that tells you a lot more than whether they you know can do this here or do this here. But it's the selection that I always like to look for in 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 the work okay. that they do so having said that yeah. uh what's on your mind diane like what what is a pebble you know that uh, is rattling around in your shoe right now um that uh-huh. you want to shake loose and that we can dive in here together yeah i i sort of have two but i'll start with just one um where i am in my first year of uh, trying to implement all 14 practices of uh, Peter Lilia Dahl's thinking classroom. I did just the, the upright boards um, and problem solving in random groups for the previous two years, but this year I've added in all the other stuff. And um, well, there's I'm wondering so when you things. say that, I was going to yeah. just ask when you say that. <laughs> there was yeah. like a huff. There was like a, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking, cause you're like, 14. I, I started with like the first, you know, with two. And then I tried to do all the rest, the other 12. And I'm wondering if maybe we might already have one of the issues <laughs> that might be happening, but keep going, yeah. keep going. Well, there's just so much. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. There's so much. I mean, I think many of us doing thinking classrooms, we have that pebble of, you know, I've got a strong student working with a student that has more challenges and um, is hanging back and how do I get them both engaged? So that continues to be an issue for me. And, you know, I do walk around and give little prods and pushes and comments. Um, That's, Mm -hmm. you know, just an ongoing, challenge I think um I've got I I've so this year I'm doing scaffolded notes at the end of every unit Mm -hmm. which are highly scaffolded with Mm -hmm. really just sort of fill in the blanks for the kids followed by check your understanding questions uh mild medium and spicy Mm -hmm. and um for context, our school does not give marks. Our school does not have tests. We don't mm-hmm. give homework. The report cards are just um, comments, no mm-hmm. grades. Mm-hmm. Um, and we give feedback just sort of, you know, orally. And then um, in parent, teacher, student conferences, we give kind of what would normally be communicated through a report card. What would you say is is the real, like the real kind of issue here to, that we can kind of dive in today because I know there's this, like we've got we've got you know varying levels of, of students in our classroom we, we're trying to implement 14 you know practices or 12 new practices in our classroom this year you've got you know you're you're in a school that's kind of balancing feedback uh with with making sure students progress so so think about all of those things what would you say is the real struggle that you're you're kind of battling right now So yeah, I think I think the key thing I'd like to focus on is how to give the kids feedback, you know, about where they are and where they're going in this um, in this uh, very sort of complex web of mm-hmm. the thinking classroom. You know, like there's so many parts, and um, 
And, you know, I do have that sense of like not enough time that many of us have, which is not really helpful, but there it is. Um, so I give them the, um, the scaffolded notes and they do their check your understanding questions. And then I launch into the next unit. Mm -hmm. And um, so according to, you know, uh, Peter's work, those um, check your understanding questions are, are really just for the kids own um, use really. And uh, we don't want to mark them. We don't want to even necessarily look at them. So the, the kids just feel like, yeah, I'm just going to do this. And the value is in the doing of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure. I don't think the the kids necessarily know just from having done those questions, what they know and what they don't know. Right. They do have an answer key so they can find out for themselves which questions are right, which questions are wrong. Mm -hmm. But like I have some kids who go through mild, medium, spicy, they want to do them all. They get, you know, most of them right. Like, I guess for them, they know, like, I know my stuff pretty well. I have some kids like sort of at the other end who get through sort of two of the mild questions and they're not really uh, sure what they don't know or what they know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think most of the kids in the middle don't really know, you know, it, it might right. be, for example, a unit on um, uh, multiplication strategies. I, I use Pam Harris's work a lot. Mm -hmm. So nice. um, I, you know, she has this wonderful uh, summary of the, you know, the most useful strategies for the four operations. So they'll have um, the notes beside them. And then I ask them to, you know, try to use the strategies from your notes when you're doing this. But I just feel like the feedback part is kind of missing. I don't think it's enough mm. for them to just do those questions and, and then find out if they're right or wrong. Right. Cause that's so, where it ends. Yeah. And, and I guess the, the wonder I was having, I was picturing like when you were talking about the mild, medium, spicy and you, you know, assume, you know, we can assume that students who are doing all three types and they're doing, you know, fairly well are probably going like, you know, I, I've got a handle on this. But those students in the middle, um, I, the question I was wondering is like, do you feel that those students, you know, I'm going to use your word and say, do you feel those students own the math? Or do you feel that they're not sure if they own the math? Or mm -hmm. do they actually not believe they own the math? And based on that, I think that can at least help us to kind of figure out, okay, you know, if they own the math, then, and if they believe they own the math, then we're in good shape. But if they don't own the math mm -hmm. and they don't believe they own the math, and, and I might even argue, like some students might even barely, like when we say own it, it's like they might, they, maybe they should feel like they own it, but they actually don't. And that's problematic as well. Mm -hmm. So where would you put, let's say, those students that aren't necessarily the ones that are, you know, having, you know, fairly little issues with these all three types of problems? And then I guess my wonder for you would be is like, for those who aren't and aren't owning it, it's like, what might we be able to change to give them more opportunities to own it? Right. Because if what I'm hearing as well is that if we're not doing, you know, any formal types of assessment, um, you know, let's say a, like an actual summative. Right. I mean, in our world, everything is formative, but the ultimate like if we're not actually doing that and then we're not actually providing them with an opportunity to to really test their knowledge, not just at the end of one lesson, but, you know, days later, uh -huh. then they might not really own it and then it might just kind of fade into space. So uh -huh. I'm yeah. wondering, you know, where's your thinking around that? And might there be something that we can maybe add, alter, shift to be able to provide that for our uh -huh. students? Yeah, I think you're kind of hitting on it there that um, my sense is that they don't feel like they own it and they don't feel like, you know, some do, but there are too many of the students 
who I think do those questions and those like, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily um, building their confidence as, as mathematicians or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and I would say similarly, when I do the consolidation, you know, I've got those few keen kids, um, but there are for me too many kids who uh, I don't feel like they're walking out of the lesson going, yeah, I really got that. That made sense. You know? Right. Um, <laughs> do you feel, do you feel like that you're unsure if they've got it or you know they don't they don't got it like i'm i'm just trying to decide like when they walk out the door and you're saying some of them are unsure whether what that was today i'm i'm just curious do you do you think like do you have a good sense of that on that day who's got it and who doesn't got it like do you feel confident with that when you're when you're working with the kids and and seeing that yeah you're like i got this like i know exactly where everyone is because if Mm -hmm. we're gonna and okay because that that's really i think that's really important right because especially with if if you're you're providing feedback and it's all about moving them you know Mm -hmm. along the trajectory of where they're they're trying to get to on you know a particular learning goal for that lesson or or for the unit you know knowing where your student is and being able to kind of give them the nudge or give them that that next step is mm-hmm. is is really important. So do you do you do you yeah do you do you think that they've got it or or we do you think there's more to dig you know for yourself? So I circulate around and um, for sure connect with pretty much every kid during a problem solving uh, class. So I feel like I know where each of them is, Mm -hmm. you know, with regard to that particular um, concept or skill. Um, But I don't feel like they know. Mm. Um, And, you know, it is a very particular context where there aren't marks and, you know, for good reasons uh, that I believe in. Um, Mm -hmm. But then without that kind of blunt instrument of a mark, Mm-hmm. then I need to find another way for them to know. Well, you know, my, my thought is like something that could be as easy as, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, a green, yellow, uh, maybe red might not be the right color, but you know, you get the idea of like giving them a sense because I'm sure a lot of students, like even especially if let's say you use sticky notes, like maybe you use sticky notes, maybe avoid red, maybe avoid, you know, orange or, you know, that, Maybe you pick colors like blue, green, and purple, and you have them have a meaning. Uh, Or you can go the other way and say like red is spicy. That's a good thing. You know, like, wow, you're really spicy at this. Right. And you could potentially offer, you know, I'm thinking kind of two angles. Like first, if you already know, that's amazing. That's important. Like John said, very important for us to know if you already know then give them the opportunity with the stickies to kind of put a sticky note out based on where they think they are. And what that's going to tell you is it's going to help you align whether like, are they where I think they're at? Like, do they think they're at the same place that I think they're at or are they missing something? And then that gives you something new to think about of like, Oh, if they think that they're spicy, which is good. And I think that you're, you know, very mild, you know, or whatever, like whatever you want to call it. Right. right? I think you're mild right now. Um, and, and, you know, you define what those things mean in your classroom and you make sure that everything is for growth and positivity and that this is Uh not a judgment, but more or less an instrument to help you determine how we can get better. This is a culture of growth. We're always learning. We're always getting better. Um, the beauty is when students are are like essentially putting down a sticky note that aligns with what you think the sticky note should be. Uh And then the next question becomes, which is maybe the harder question is what opportunity can I give to that student so that they can actually make the progress? Because one of the challenges that teachers in general have is that, you know, time, as you've already articulated is hard, 
But also if I don't have, let's say this typical, you know, end of chunk, end of unit, end of, you know, block sort of assessment, which everybody hates, like everyone who has that in their structure hates it because it's limiting. But then when we don't have it, sometimes we sort of like lose track of like, you know, like we, we're almost losing an opportunity to kind of push to get better. It's like, it's like a hockey team practicing, uh -huh. but there's never a game, you know, like there's never a yeah. game. So it's like, I don't get to see whether yeah. it's actually translating into something. So I wonder if there might be something like the stickies that you might be able to offer in terms of not formalizing it as a true assessment or as a, a true summative or anything like that. But just, you know, we go back a lot of times to our, what we call our growth days, you know, in a lotting time so that students can pick what they need to work on. And that might require you to help them as well, right? Because if a student picks spicy for everything for themselves and you're like, actually, you know what? I feel like, you know, you're more medium on this one. Then so you're giving them this opportunity to do some of that growth, but it's also differentiated so that it's not the same for everyone. It's not a test that everybody has to sit and write and sweat and worry and cause stress and anxiety, but it does give them an opportunity and you an opportunity to work with students more individually, as well as to actually allow them an op and what you can tell them is, Hey, we're, we're doing this growth day or whatever we want to call it, because I want to give you an opportunity to own one concept today. Like that's what we're going to do today. You can't own them all today, but like, we're going to pick one concept individually. And some of them are going to be the same and some of them are going to be different. But the goal here is we want you to own this. So if there's something you don't own yet, that's what we're going to work on. And that would just require you to have maybe a few extra, you know, problems or material but, that uh -huh. you use and and try to to use to grow from. What 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 is also important in in that you need for that type of system to go, you know, like when you said like one of the things is like how do I give them the right feedback and how do I you know get them to move when I know they're not ready yet is, is thinking about what Kyle is saying with these growth, like a growth day or, or, or a chunk of time where they're, they're moving, you know, they're at say my medium mild and you want them to get them to medium. It's like, we have to have a really clear picture of like what we expect for mild. And then what we expect to see medium and spicy like we need success criteria here to go like when i see this consistently you are at the medium you know you're doing medium level questions on this learning goal but now because i see that i'm documenting it right i'm going to write that down that we've got this it's not a mark it's just a tracker and it's like saying like this is where you are now our goal is to get you to the next level you know, the next stage but you we have to be clear on what that looks like so when we see it consistently we can go moving on now you're here but the student also needs to know it right the student needs yeah. to know this is what medium yeah. looks like and mm -hmm. when you can do this consistently and here's what consistently means on this particular skill then when you can do that consistently then you know then i you know you need to move to like you're at this stage right now but i want you to get to here and that's your goal next. Like what Kyle's saying is like, you have a chunk of time. It's like, now you're going to own this skill. Now you're, you're, you're going from medium to spicy. You're going from mild to medium. And that's what you're doing today. But here's what it looks like when you get there so that we know what the target is. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that's really good feedback. Um, like I'm wondering if after our notes and check your understanding questions, then I could be giving the kids a very specific self-assessment sort of rubric really for them to fill out, which then I can look at and see if I agree with them. Um, and then that rubric could guide like a, the work they do on, on a growth day. I love that term growth day. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause yeah, I mean, I know this is podcast, but I have a, like a visual here of just um, like, this is the kind of um, notes that they're doing. So say for multiplication, we've got four different strategies. We've got- I love it. 
partial products over under flexible factoring and doubling and halving, and they're filling in the blanks. And so then I'll give them a bunch of multiplication questions. And the thing is, um, they won't necessarily use all these strategies. They'll just use the one or two that they're really comfortable with. So if I followed this up with, you know, the four strategies and, um, you know, uh, are you um, not sure, pretty sure, or really sure how to use that strategy or really confident, you know, whatever it is, I could have kind of three levels, then they could, um, after having done the questions, they could, they could assess themselves and, and then they could know where to focus on, on another day of like sort of practice or um, consolidation. I love it. Solo, and, and not, not at the boards. Right. And, and something that's really important as well, like giving students the opportunity to self-assess really I'm assuming the student does it right. Sometimes, you know, some students are reluctant to actually, you know, put in the thinking required, but the goal, if they are encouraged to self-assess and they do try to self-assess is it actually gets them to be reflective, right? So, you know, it's metacognitive and they, they look over and they go, you know, what is this strategy really about? Cause like, if I'm saying, I understand it, you know, do I really understand it or giving them a problem and saying, here's, a problem. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually challenge you. I love using the word challenge. I'm going to challenge you to try that strategy, right? Even though you might find this strategy easier, I'm going to push you to try that strategy with this problem so that you can get better at it. Right. And I think sometimes that's, that can be hard in mathematics, especially when we're trying to use strategies is that as soon as there's a strategy that seems to be one that works well for me, I'm going to lean on that heavily, right? So whether it's uh -huh. stacking or whether it's, you know, any any strategy that I've used, compensation is one, you know, you'll see once students learn compensation, oftentimes they try to use it in every number talk and then you're not actually getting any better at any other strategies. So sometimes yeah. we have to almost say, listen, I actually want you to like not use that strategy. It's a great strategy. Love it. We want you to know it and use it whenever you feel it's appropriate. But today for this one moment, I want to push you here. And yeah. when they are self-assessing and being given this opportunity to kind of give themselves a little bit of, um, you know, an indicator as to where they are in the learning, that can really allow them to take ownership, not just of the mathematics, but ownership of the learning, you know, and like the responsibility of the learning for themselves. Because at the end of the day, that's really what we want, right? Right. We don't always yeah. get it with every student, but what we want is for students to take ownership, to want to learn, to want to push themselves, just like we want everyone, every student to be pushing themselves in all aspects of life, right? Uh -huh. Doesn't yeah. always happen that way, but that's what we're trying to encourage. So it sounds like, you know, based on what you've, you've been telling us today is that you're giving your students a lot of opportunities to do a lot of great learning a lot of great collaboration, a lot of great thinking. And this particular pebble, I feel like, I feel like, you know, you've got some ideas here to kind of shake that out. It might take some time as you try to strategize what that looks like and refine what it looks like. But, uh -huh. you know, when we wrap this conversation here today, I'm wondering, do you have any big takeaways or maybe next steps that you plan to put in action based on some of what we discussed here today? Well, I think I will try that uh, just giving one more day, um, one more class after wrapping up a unit uh, for kids to self-assess and, and then practice in the areas where they, they've identified that they need more work, for sure. And um, I think in general, like just, I think the kids are in a bit of a, a feedback vacuum because of not having the marks. Um, and, and I think there's a kind of an anxiety that can grow into that vacuum. So um, yeah, I want to uh, figure out more ways to be giving them feedback. Just, you know, I'm, I'm here to make sure that you're uh, challenged and trying your hardest and 
finding out all the amazing things you can do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, an exciting kind of direction to focus on. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That sounds like some, some really good next, next steps there. Um, what would you say is an immediate, immediate next step for tomorrow? Tomorrow? Well, um, Hmm. I have an opportunity right now because I have a student teacher. So uh, I'm kind of excited to watch her um, teach the kids and do a consolidation so that I can step back and really check out how the different kids are participating in, in that really important consolidation phase. So I think, you know, in the next class with, with her leading the consolidation, I, I want to hone in on, um, on where those kids are at in terms of actually engaging in the consolidation. Cause, um, I think this relates to their sense of, uh, owning the math and, um, knowing where they are and where they need to go that is a bit, uh, a bit weak. Um, I think I'm just gonna try to make some really uh, concrete observations about particular kids and then uh, coach them a little bit more because I, I'm gonna have this extra teacher um, right. who also needs coaching, right. but uh, I think it's a chance to, to step back and, and really observe my students. Awesome. Awesome stuff. That's and fantastic. Would would you be open for us to check in with you in you know in six months or or start of next year to see how things have gone and, and how for things sure. have progressed? I would love to talk to you guys more. Yeah. That would be awesome. great. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much for for joining us on uh on the, on this episode and, and speaking with us this evening. Thank you guys. Take good care. You Take care. too as well.